already. I've just come from a country where the opposition is not terribly loyal <laughs> to the other party, and we wait for the elections that are yet to come in a few days. I want to thank Ram Madhav and MJ Akbar, two people I've known for many years and respected a great deal, for inviting me to this conference and to interact with this panel and with you in the audience here. Some 70 years ago, India emerged as an independent country with daunting challenges at home and abroad. There was poverty and illiteracy, ethnic diversity, and scattered secessionist uh, movements in the country, as well as the emergence of the Cold War in its own neighborhood. In 1947, many commentators predicted that this country would not last as a democracy or even as a united country. I can think of the eminent economist, Gunnar Myrdal, who expressed doubts if a country this poor and socially diverse could survive as a united country. It's already been mentioned um, about the comments of Winston Churchill, that irascible imperialist, who agreed, he argued that uh, a country as socially diverse as India was not really a country at all. It had been put together by the British, and once the British left, the country would very likely collapse. Well, here we are, 70 years later. India has not collapsed, and it has <laughs> thrived. It has thrived as a democracy. There's only been one um, uh, episode where it moved away from democracy, and you're all aware of that, 1975 to 77. That has not been repeated in this country, and my guess is we're not likely to see a repetition of that anytime soon. The consensus for a democratic process in this country, I think, is witnessed by the fact that a higher percentage of the poor and illiterate in India vote than do the rich and the literate. This is unique in the world, where the opposite is true in almost every democratic country. At the international level, India is acknowledged to be one of the world's rising powers, and while not yet recognized as a great power on the international stage, it is a contender for that status and in the not too very distant future. India is among the large countries of the world, the fastest growing at 7.5% GDP at an annual basis. That's at a faster pace than China, and it has been for the next few years and is likely to be for the next several years as well. If you look at the nearby Indian Ocean neighborhood, India is an area of relative calm in a broad swath, swath of crisis that my uh, SAIS colleague and foreign policy expert Zbigniew Brzezinski once described as an arc of crisis. Elected civil, civilian authority in India is considered legitimate by the vast majority of the population. At the geostrategic level, India juts down 1,500 miles into the middle of the Indian Ocean that is crossed by critical sea, lean, sea lanes, and that forces the country to look east and west for trade, for investment, and for raw materials. The key question in all of this is whether India is sufficiently daring to take advantage of these, of these uh, ad advantages that it has and make a change in a changing world. In short, can India get past the transactional relations with individual countries and pursue a major strategic vision as a player at the global high table? I think the answer to this is maybe. It's not necessarily going to happen unless the Indians, in my view, manage two challenges particularly well. One has to do with domestic politics and the other has to do with economic growth. Let me take the issue of domestic politics first. And that requires mobilizing support for an assertive and imaginative foreign policy that requires, in my view, considerable po political stability at home and a leadership with a foreign policy vision. India presently has a political stable system and a prime minister with a vision in Mr. and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. 
Whether this is possible as you look out, however, is not at all a given. India has a fragmented political system. The elections in, 19, in 2014 saw a single party emerge with a majority, the BJP, for the first time since 1984. And chances are good that there might be a return to coalition politics in India again in the 2019 parliamentary elections, the one that is likely to be led by an NDA coalition and led by the BJP. The imperatives of a revived coalition politics at the center may mean that, poli that foreign policy decisions are constrained by parochial concerns of regional political parties. I'm reminded several years ago that the ratification of a rivers agreement with Bangladesh was sabotaged by the opposition of one of the country's major regional parties. While there is a legacy of both strong and weak coalition governments in this country, coalitions necessarily complicate the effort to make change. Second, on the economy, continued high growth at 7% plus faces the political reality of a population in India that remains largely poor and a traditional commitment to equity in Indian political life. The unmet needs of India's poor and its huge infrastructure needs to stimulate jobs also means that the guns and butter debate must be addressed in this country. And India's defense spending, now at 1.62% uh, of GDP, which is the lowest share of national income since 1962, will not fund the military modernization that a leading power and a security provider needs for its defense needs. India faces several challenges requiring leadership to chart the course on a daring path. And to my mind come four issues that are especially important. One is a rising China that is both richer and militarily stronger than India with an inter interest in deepening relations in this part of the world. Second is a terrorist threat from the northeast, the northwest of the subcontinent. Third is increasing integration in the world economy. And fourth is a looming environmental crisis, such as the melting of the Himalayan glaciers. So what will it take for India to move to a leadership position on these issues that has a direct effect on it? And here I would like to refer to a speech that India's External Affairs Secretary, S. Jai Shankar, gave at an April 6, 2016 inauguration of the Indian Center of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in New Delhi, where he addresses the issue of whether India can become a major actor on the world stage. He starts his discussion with the categorical statement, and I quote, the quest towards becoming a leading power rest first and foremost on our success in expanding the economy, end quote. And I concur with that. He further says that this quest must be a priority goal for Indian diplomats, and perhaps with an eye on his own bureaucracy, asserts, and I quote, this task calls for a change in attitude and the skills of our diplomats, which I can affirm, he says, is already underway. While he links South Asia closely to India as an important immediate goal of Indian diplomacy, he notes, and I quote, that as an, as an aspiring leading power at a, minim at a minimum, India needs to expand its global footprint far beyond the region and specifically mentions a balanced relationship with the US, Russia, EU, Japan, and China. And yet, he further adds that an important characteristic, and this is a quote of a power that, go, that seeks to go beyond a limited agenda, uh, is, is, is its interest in global issues, such as terrorism and climate change. In short, it has to move beyond transactional relations with any single country. I think the issues raised by the External Affairs Secretary are possible because 
Prime Minister Modi is willing to think differently about India and how it should react with the world. The question is how deeply and politically sustainable are the Prime Minister's new way and new approach? And will it be undermined by liberals on the left who often put ideology above self-interest self and a nativist right that has little appreciation of the world and is easily influenced by xenophobia? In summary, I argue that if India is to assume a role as a leader in international affairs, it must become more deeply interactive with those of other countries. The hard part is going to be getting there. Thank you.